Okay. Is my mic it's not echoing now? No, it's good. Sounds good. Okay. Live up. Hello, welcome everybody. I hope everyone is well. Um, it's good to see. We've had over, gosh, we've done, this is the third session of the day. We've had over 200 people so far. So it's great to see people. Uh, as always, let us know in the chat where you're from, what type of things you're doing. Let us know if you've been on all seven of the sessions so far. Um, <clears throat> good to see people. Big up the KIP Education Collective. <laughs> nice one, Charlotte. It's great. Again, it's <laughs> cool. It's good to see you. Okay. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. We'll just <coughs> wait and see what's going on. It's great. Oh. Hi, Nadia from Birmingham. Founder of Mind Our Mentalities. Good to see you. Good to see you. Catherine, Children's Society Inside Out Project. Nice to see you again. It's great. Okay, we'll give it a few minutes and then um, I'll introduce our guest speaker. Welcome. So, um, great. So welcome to session seven of our COVID-19 Young People in Isolation Conference. Um, this conference has been able to be made possible by City Bridge Trust. My name is Ben Lindsay. I am CEO of a charity called Power to Fight. Uh, we empower communities to end youth violence. And one of the things that we do is that we, we put on conferences and workshops and bring some of the best practitioners across the country to share their wisdom. And um, before I introduce our, our next guest, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, any questions? So, so our, our guest speaker, Ray Douglas, will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes. So any questions that you have, I'd appreciate if you could put it into the Q&A. A section of your Zoom bar, which is at the bottom, and we'll we'll answer and facilitate them at the end. Any uh, abuse or anything which we sense and see as being insensitive, we'll just politely remove you. But so far in six sessions, we've not had any problems like that. So, uh, Ray Douglas is somebody I've known for over ten years. Uh, one of the best practitioners and minds around this issue of young people, uh, youth violence, gangs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is somebody who has taught me uh, a lot about just thinking critically and differently about this issue. And today he will be looking at uh, safeguarding young people online. Um, I'm jealous of his background because his virtual background is better than anything I could probably bring to the table. Although, should we start trying to, should we get competitive? Let's see, what, what have we got here? What have I, what can I bring to the table? I probably haven't gotten. I'm now, just stop the Chelsea flag, bro. Chel no, let's not talk about Chelsea today. We didn't, uh, no, hold on. We can go a little bit of a fight there, but that doesn't. Nice, nice. Yeah. yeah, not bad, not bad. But yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, but Ray, over to you. Let us know what's going down. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Ray Douglas, um, a systemic youth violence practitioner working in and around the space for approximately two decades now. Um, so seeing the great work that Ben and Power of the Fight have been doing over the, you know, over the COVID lockdown and before that, but especially embracing the online space and the, um, what, what we will call today, we'll call it the third space, okay? Um, it's, very, it's interesting that a lot of people are struggling um, as practitioners 
that's not their fault, but it's about um, not future proofing, future proofing the work. Um, and why I'm saying that is because I was reading an article by um, an, uh, an organization called 97th Floor. And what they were saying is that you've got different quadrants in this era of COVID in terms of organizations. So some of the, some of the quadrants, I'm going to share two of the quadrants with you. One of the quadrants is opportunists, right? The other quadrant is survivors, right? Or thrivers. So if you look at, for example, House Party as an app, House Party as an app was an opportunist moment, whereas Netflix was a thriving moment, right? Does that make sense? And I think the same question has to come around um, practitioners and organizations that work with young people. Is your organization in COVID, is it an opportunist organization or is it a thriving organization? I'm, which I mean, is it, how is it going to adapt? Is this here the future of youth work? Will it ever get to a place where we will be um, in and amongst each other, in and amongst young people with practitioners? I believe it will return to that, but not anytime soon. So one of the things I want to kind of share today, and I know Ben doesn't, won't be surprised that I'm going to go a bit left field, because I could do a presentation and talk about the 20 steps to safeguarding young people online and making sure that your parent, parental controls are on and making sure that the, the laptop's not in their bedroom and all the things that you know or you're supposed to know. But what I want to do is just, just to revisit where we are as a society, not just as a community, but as a society, as it responds to this new wave. Um, 50, 60 years ago, people, some, in some communities, they felt that the TV was the devil. Before that, other people felt that the radio was the devil. But what's interesting, and it's a bit of a harsh word, but if you look back, you know, a lot of people didn't embrace TV and radio straight away. But what, when, you, when, you, when you take a look at where we are now as uh, a community, as parents, as practitioners, it's okay for you to say that you can't keep up with social media. If you can honestly put your hand on your hand and say, you know, I can't keep up. Because the truth is, what's the top app today won't be in the next three months. There are some pillars that will stay and that will be evergreen, but there are apps jump in and jump out. But what I want us to do to start today, like any good training session, I want you to all in front of your phones, laptops, tablets, I want you to read this out loud, please. I'll give you 30 seconds, okay? Read it out loud. I'd love to hear you, but the webinar is gonna allow it. Okay, because you're all great thinkers, you should have finished by now. So I always ask people when I use this tool, is how did you do that? And what people often say is, um, they actually read what the text says. Um, they, no, but I says, how do you do that? And you, I never hear words like cerebrum, neocortex, limbic system. I never hear those words. And essentially those are key words because how do we process information? Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, and I'd, lo I'd love if there's any neuroscientists on the webinar, but the truth is we are talking about the end product of social media. But how about if we go inside? How about if we look at the inner game? How about if we look at, um, you know, what are the side effects? So um, what I want to do, though, is a little, um, a little quiz. So can you all just type in, and we'll find out who got it right after. Can you all just type in the chat? or the Q&A chat, the name of this game, please. And Ben, if you can keep an eye on them. All right, the name of this game. Okay, quickly. Let's see. Okay, okay, okay. Anyone else know the name of this game? All right, last chance. The name of this game, please. Okay, well, 
exactly what I thought. You're absolutely wrong. It's actually hang person. It's 2020. So can you all get with it, please? Thank you very much. So we're going to play a game of hang person, right? So um, some of you need to go on unconscious bias training. Hopefully Ben will set that up in future. Hang person, not hangman. We're fighting back. Um, let's go back to that, that image, that great image. And why I say it's a great image is because um, not necessarily um, for the reasons that everyone else says, but why I see that as a great image is because it reminds me of the greatness that a lot of communities from the diaspora um, came from. Now, we, as you can see there, how people were dressed, um, you know, how they looked, they had all these dreams and aspirations. So what I want to do is, is do a quick quiz. So what percentage of, um, what percentage of people from the Caribbean, what percentage of people from the Caribbean came to the UK with a qualification or a trade? So please write that, feel free to write that in the chat. What percentage of people from the diaspora, from the Caribbean, etc., um, came to the UK with a trade and or a qualification? Feel free to throw your number in the room. Okay. Okay, next question. What percentage came to the UK with a criminal record? What percentage came to the UK with a criminal record? So first question, what percentage came with a trade and or a qualification? Or what percentage came with a criminal record? All right. And the third question is, how far is the sun from the earth? And that's got nothing to do with today's webinar. I just want to see if people are awake. How far is the sun from the earth? So anyway, the first question, what percentage came to the UK with a trade and or a qualification? So it depends which report you read or research you do. But on average, they say between 95 and 97% of those gentlemen and ladies came to the UK with a qualification and or a skill. Carpentry, joinery, um, you know, electronics, you name it. Mill, all, all these skills. In terms of the, how many came to the UK with a criminal record, the answer is 0% because you weren't allowed to come to the UK with a criminal record. And finally, how far is the sun from the earth? I think last time I checked about 92, 93 million miles, but that's by the by today. What's my point? My point is, so why within 50, 60 years, etc., why, why are some of the young offenders institutes, some of the prisons where I've worked, so I've worked in about 20 prisons approximately across the UK. Why are some of those prisons between 65 and 70% full of, here's the word that everyone's getting frustrated with, but we're gonna use it for reference sake, BAME, right? Um, why are some of these Young Offenders Institutes prisons 65% black and minority ethnic? And I think when we're done with this, I think, well, I think what's clear today, I was listening to some talks earlier. We are fed up with the word BAME, aren't we? Let's be honest. BAME is, is um, disingenuous, to say the least. And it doesn't factor in people's socioeconomic DNA, location, or even culture. So um, I, I find BAME as difficult to swallow as black on black crime, but that's another conversation. So how did it happen? My question is, if you look at those pictures there and you look at the, 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 these young men who arrived in the UK, so some of the people who are online today, some of your parents or grandparents, um, why within 60 years approximately are some of these prisons um, disproportionately full of their children or grandchildren. It's a thought, and people say different things. Some people say institutional racism, you know, some people say um, you know, inequality, all the things. But one thing that is a universal law is that the apple actually shouldn't fall too far from the tree. 
An apple shouldn't fall too far from the tree, right? That's what they say. So, okay, let's go a bit deeper then. So, um, this, what you see there is social media 1960s style. Social media in the 1960s. If it wasn't printed or written, it didn't happen, right? Now think about that. Maybe 100 people would walk past that house every day, maybe 200. Um, and clearly you'd see the political position or ideology of the person who put that in the window. I'm, um, I'm a progeny of a Jamaican father and a white Irish mother. So I, I get it when I, when, I, when I hear that people think that racism is something new, um, that the word systemic is something new, that all of a sudden Black Lives Matter, for many people who've been in and around the trenches around race equality for many years, we understand that it's not that it's something new, it's just that everything has a tipping point, right? Everything has a tipping point. So what was the counter? So that's, this was the tweet back. So you saw people, um, you know, exp expressing themselves. And then you had this great movie. So if, if any of you haven't seen this film, I try and watch this film at least once a year. And it's an interesting film. So it's built around Thatcher's Britain, um, the, children of the, ch the children of those who came from Windrush, essentially, who are at this intersectionality of identity. Are they British? Are they Caribbean? Are they African? They've got overt racism, there's no jobs, they've got this passion for culture. And I, I tell everyone to watch this film. If you haven't watched it already, please go and get it, order it. Or if you've watched it numerous times, revisit it again, especially in these times. But why is it interesting? Because this was the only messaging that we had. So it went from print to video, right? Print to video and obviously TV. And what's interesting now in this era of, um, transparency a lot of these 80s and 90s and early 2000s comedians who built their careers paid for their mortgages sent their children through private schools on the back of disrespecting um, people of the african and africa african caribbean diaspora because the truth is if you think about programs like mind your language and rising damp and a lot of these programs they were um you know, the theme throughout them was overt racism and prejudice, okay? So we've gone from print, so radio, print, TV, right? So let's begin with the end in mind. You may or may not agree with me, but this is my opinion. As it relates to social media, ladies and gentlemen, the horse is bolted. The horse has bolted. And I think, I believe from my experience that um, there were certain windows where we could have done a lot, of more, lot more. And as a society, probably we didn't have the tools and the skills or see the side effects. So me and, me and, um, uh, me and uh, one of my friends were speaking, school friends today were speaking this morning, and we were talking about growing up in you know, Afro-Caribbean households. And we used to be get fed this drink, this Jamaican syrup, right? And um, it was so sugary and it was amazing. If you could get it with a glass of milk, he was amazed. Um, and then if any of your relatives came over from Jamaica, they'd bring this cheese and it was like, you know, like a semi little kind of arch block. And you thought, yeah, we've got Jamaican cheese. But when we look back on it, it was diabetes in a bottle and processed cheese. That was like, you know, three or four places away from being plastic. So the side effects of social media, we are beginning to see now, right? It's gone beyond just attention. We're seeing the side effects. We're seeing a whole shift, right? So what's interesting is, um, if you all could just put your phones in your hand, please, right? And just have a little test if your phone's by you and show me how you hold your phones. I can't see, but just, just show me how you hold your phones. So some of you got it right, but most of you probably went like that, yeah? Most of you went like that. But the truth is, that's how most people use their phones. 
right? Yet most of you went like that. And what's interesting is you're the same parents that will say, are you ever going to get off your phone? Or you're the same uh, partner who says, how come you're always on your phone? Now, what's interesting is uh, the TV. So companies used to jostle and fight for advertising on the Super Bowl, right? American football, the biggest competition of the year. They used to get, if you could get, adver, uh, if you could get um, an advert on the Super Bowl, you won. Now, they realize that actually nobody's sitting down and watching the advert on the Super Bowl. Everyone's going like this, right? It's just like this generation of young people. The ones that we're talking about now have never not known the internet. They've never not known the internet. Now think about that. The funny, you know, some of you may have experienced this, but I, Ray Douglas, I was the TV remote at home. I was the TV remote. And on some occasions I was the aerial. What do I mean is that yes, in order for it to change the channel, you had to get up and press a button. And if the reception weren't right, sometimes you put a coat hanger in the back. And that sounds so far fetched. Where every single human now has more resources than the King of Spain had uh, less than a hundred years ago in their hand. So the ship has sailed, the horse has bolted. So what does that mean? How do we remain fit for purpose? Let's be honest, some people in this lockdown have realized how good or how bad parent they were or are. In this lockdown, a lot of people have said, you know what, I'm not gonna give my children's teacher a hard time anymore because teaching is hard work. But also there's some of you thought, you know what, this homeschooling's an option, or it's been able to make you speak to your children more, or you've, had to, you've been able to rest more. But also beyond this, we've had this increase in young people online. So what I've been saying is, there's a bottleneck coming. I just saw the statistics, I think yesterday in Birmingham alone, um, there's 31 guns discharged in the lockdown period. 31 guns discharged in the lockdown period, which speaks exactly to what I was saying, that there's a bottleneck. So because more of us are online, especially with young people, there's more conflict. And I heard Craig some say, speak about something similar earlier. So I'm telling you what you know already. But let's go a bit deeper. So this is 2017. So, you know, things have obviously changed. But let's look at that. So the blue line indicates the spaces that Facebook own and the red, what Google own, right? But there's something missing. Can anyone um, see which is what's missing? Which platform? Feel free to type it. Which platform is missing? And don't say TikTok. Anyone? There you go. Yeah. Brother Darren, I see you. WhatsApp. Now, isn't it interesting? We've all got that friend who says, can't stand social media. I'm not on social media. But they're a serial WhatsApp message sender. Right? We've all got WhatsApp, serial WhatsApp message senders. We've probably all become serial WhatsApp message senders over the lockdown. Now, my question to you is, why did Facebook pay just short of 20 billion pounds for WhatsApp? 20 billion pounds, dollars, sorry, for WhatsApp. For a, for a company that in um, 2013, 2014, was only turning over about 13 million a year. There's no adverts on WhatsApp at the moment. But let me give you the metrics. Currently, and it's probably increased, obviously, in the lockdown. If pre-lockdown, you ready for this? Two billion people, two billion people were on WhatsApp every day before the lockdown. Two billion people, nearly a third of the planet were on WhatsApp with no adverts, 
no posting in terms of your own platform, the creating posts, just straight messaging, two billion people. So what does that tell us? Well, for me, it says, well, one thing specifically, all the other platforms you can flag, Facebook, YouTube, Insta, obviously TikTok now. And if I see any of you doing any role play on TikTok, we can't be friends. Let me just put that out there. Anyway, however, there's no encryption around WhatsApp. It's unregulated. For the most part, you can send what you want. Yet WhatsApp's being used in the courts of, court of law. Think about that. Two billion, probably, probably double that over the lockdown, but let's say half, three and a half billion people a year, um, three and a half billion people using WhatsApp in the lockdown period, unregulated. But it's encrypted. So quite often, when you and me as practitioners or parents or elders, what we're looking at actually, we're looking at the wrong thing because this word in this era of addressing race hate, and let's call it what it is, race hate, it's allowed us to really explore this word systemic, right? We used to say institutionalized, but systemic is at the top of the, top of the ladder now. What does it mean? But for me, it's not just about what does it mean? How does it play out? Well, you know Facebook own WhatsApp and Instagram, right? You knew that already. So two different platforms, right? So how do we, with this big machine, big machine, right? Multi kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, not, I try not to get things wrong, but if you look how much these companies earn every year, this big machine, how do you narrow it down to you, your family, the young people that you're working with, your faith group? How do you do it? It's like, it's like David and Goliath, right? So let's remind ourselves the challenges. And um, Craig mentioned something this earlier. This is 2019, so you could probably, and this is what I would argue, I would argue you could probably triple that number, at least, at least double, double the number. You know why? Because those are statutory youth centers. And there's a ton of youth centers that are obviously third sector organizations, um, just small community organizations that do great work that aren't on that statistic. So in a, in a period where I would argue a thousand youth centers across the UK have closed down, and I'd say double those jobs lost because you know a majority of people do sessional youth work or they'll do small projects or they're kind of like freelancers where and just this is to speak to what craig was saying earlier and what's been the theme throughout today if we've lost so many spaces of intervention and that means that there's at least a thousand less safe spaces across the uk then no doubt the alternative or the place where they're going to spend more time is online it's basic maths we know that does anyone know, please, I mean, in, does in, um, let's open up the Q&A um, window. Does anyone know why so many youth centres got closed down? Because clearly, right, let's be honest, I'm sure some of you have been thinking this recently. Actually, there was money for youth work. Does anyone know why? Why so many youth centres were closed down when we knew what that impact that would have, when we knew it mean increase, an increase in um, um, antisocial behaviour, violence, sexual exploitation, county lines. We knew this, but why? Does anyone know the answer? Very simple. A lot of people talking about austerity in the, in the, in the chat. Yeah. Not just austerity, because it's not just austerity. Which people are failing to see, youth work's not statutory. 
Youth work is not statutory. A library is statutory. Youth work is not. A local authority has to evidence a certain level of youth work. They have to evidence that, and that could be badminton on the grass. That could be some detached, but in terms of the statutory nature of youth work, it's not the same as other spaces like libraries, etc. So if you look at the last um, election campaign, and I'm not party political, but one, one of the parties was saying, when we come into, it was actually uh, Labour was saying, when we come, if we come into power, we will make youth work statutory. So that's why youth work has taken a hammering. And it's taken a hammering to the extent that now we've seen the side effects of it all over this country. So the tipping point, you will not see a presentation or a keynote or a training day or a conversation with me over a coffee, except that I mentioned this book, The Tipping Point, because The Tipping Point is everything that we see now. Why? Because you know this, right? You probably, you probably if you don't, then let me, let's share it. If you're on Facebook now, and I'm on Facebook now, our coded pages look different. Our pages look different. So they're constantly increasing the capacity, the scale, the algorithms. It's constantly changing. People still see um, their Facebook page or their Instagram page or their um, TikTok page as this space that's just kind of like a place where they hang out. And they still say, Ray, I was, on, I was on the JD website the other day, and next thing I'm getting JD adverts all up in my, uh, in my feed. So it's, a, it's, it's the business, not a business, the business. So for me, why this today's um, conversation is important is because I want to remove the conversation from social media platforms to young people online. I want us to, because it's almost like we're still speaking with an analog brain in a digital world. You and I know that everything's online. You and I know that Netflix saved your life over the lockdown, right? But it, now let's move across, not just online, let's look at the content. So let's explore, let's explore this film very quickly. One of the biggest films of 2018, 2019, maybe. Um, or everyone's, every rapper's in there, every artist's in there for the most part. Um, we see the lineup, some of the people, some of you may even know. Well, let's unpick it. The two scenes, and, I've, and I mentioned, I was on a, a webinar last week, and, the, and I'm going to stand by this because I really, I, really, I really feel passionate about this. There's two scenes in this film that nearly made me walk out the cinema. And I went to the cinema just to have a look, right? To have a look and think, well, let's see what they've done because, you know, it's, it's and, and, and let's do some housekeeping. It's black owned, you know, in the sense of it's black created. So let's see something different. So I went there and there's two scenes that nearly made me walk out. The first scene is um, where one of the guys is taking his reception child to school. And his child has got a uh, black primary school teacher. So the last time I checked, I think there were about 15 black male head teachers in the UK. Black male. I'm happy to be corrected, but last time I checked. So as he drops off his little child to reception now, so we've got black father, black son, black school teacher, which is already a rarity, especially in the primary school space. He drops off his son, he passes him a bag, a hold all. Halfway through the lesson, as you, some of you have probably seen the film, what happens? Halfway through the lesson, reception age children, armed response unit run in, and they arrest a black male teacher who's selling food and has got straps in the bag underneath his desk. So I look like this. I was in there and I, was there. I went with somebody and I wish they could verify this. And I looked at him like, did that just happen? But this is the one where that nearly made me walk out. So they're going county lines. 
going conch, they're going OT, all the words. So the, the, foot, the, sh the shot is that the drone is on, above the car. So they're following this into the deepest part, of, looked like it was deepest Essex. So they're asking, where's the plug? Where's the plug? Because they want to go and buy straps. So they're in the deep countryside now. So they, they find out where the farm is. They pull into the farm. Where's the farmer? They look to the farm. Look, oh, he's in the barn. They walk in the barn. And let's remind ourselves, the farmer is a black dreadlocks male with a South London accent. Oh, wait. Now, there's two black farmers. There's two black farmers in the UK, Wilfred Jones and the guy from JLS. And I always say this because I had to find out. So it's not just about being online. It's about what messages this online space producing and reproducing and reinforcing. I've been speaking about this for 10 years. I don't even need to get into this. But what's interesting is um, even working with primary school children now around this and primary school children talking about it was their parents who bought them the game. And, you know, as teachers saying to me, they can tell when a new, net, a new game's come out and kids are playing it all night because they're not concentrating in class. And just this systemic nature of the hammering that young people are getting from left, right, above, below. So we've got the third spaces. So we've got the Netflix, which is not social media. Then we've got obviously the games and there's a lot of research about the games. Then, you know, once again, you know me, we cannot talk about young people violence without me exposing this guy here. Um, and it's tragic, you know, when you do a lot of this work because people would come at you and say, yeah, but Ray, he gives the man them a platform and he gives, you know, yeah, three of those young men have been murdered in that picture, as you know. This 62-year-old private school educated son, father, whose dad was a bishop. Should he be online, because we're back online, because the crib session's online, it's, an, it's not on terrestrial TV, it's not on Sky, it's on YouTube. Should this gentleman be allowed this space to do this? I don't even like calling him a gentleman. Because someone said to me, I was training some social workers a while back, and it's always stuck with me. And one of them said um, something phenomenal that stayed with me. He was an old guy who was just leaving the social work practice, and he said, Ray, that picture, that picture reminds me of Jimmy Savile. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, most people remember Jimmy Savile, but if you remember Jim will fix it, you had this blonde, cigar smoking, chaparita wearing, Lacoste tracksuit rocking, cool looking guy in the Adidas Lendals, who would, and you'd write to him, look at that, back to the platform, you'd write to him and you'd say, oh Jimmy, I watch your show every week, let me on your show, um, and please make my dreams come through, and I don't know, people would ask for different things. Train with, back then it was Liverpool, uh, you know, do an a obstacle course or whatever. And if you have problems with me highlighting people like Westwood, then maybe it's because of the lens that you see. Because I always ask people this question. If he was a, a South Asian, Pakistani, Bengali gentleman from Tower Hamlets, and it was all white working class lads, with balaclavas on from Rumford or the Isle of Dogs, would he have that show pulled? Wouldn't we start using words like grooming? Because there are people who are poisoning a generation of young people, and I'm talking about white, black, Asian, all faiths. There's a, there's a culture that's poisoning them. And I've been saying this for a long time now, and I sincerely believe it, sincerely believe it, it's, not, it's no longer antisocial behavior or exploitation, it's an ideological attack. Because those are the children and the, or the grandchildren of those gentlemen that you saw come off Windrush 
and that era. But when the thing goes scra, the thing goes scra, right? And I was, I was invited to a, a, a birthday party by a family, nice middle-class family. Um, and I didn't want to go. I was like, oh, I don't want to go. And, you know, I was being asked to say, oh, we've got to show our face. And I said, no, no, I've got too much to do at the moment. I ended up being there. And then they had an entertainer. And the entertainers... Um, getting all these little music chairs together and I'm starting to think, okay, this looks familiar. And uh, it's, it's musical chairs. And what song do you think they could put on? Man's Not Hot. So when all these little five and six year olds are, the thing goes, pop, 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 and you, I'm watching it. And yeah, I always say, I was, I was tempted to pull out a flip chart paper and have a conversation. But back to the thing about systemic, You know, and let's be honest, it's not about, I think people have said it numerous occasions, it's not necessarily about critiquing the individuals. I kind of believe that, although there's some exceptions, but at the same time, we have to start calling out bad practice. We have to start calling out inequality. A lot of people saw the whole Glastonbury this time last year, Stormzy, big show, sponsored by Adidas, Banksy Vest, all of that. But maybe it's me, maybe, maybe I'm getting a bit too old, but I saw um, tens of thousands of non-black people with a license to scream out nigger for 90 minutes, following all the lyrics. Systemic. So why? This, if you look at the timestamp, so 29th of June, 2020, this is Birmingham. So a meetup by a, and this is a word that, it grinds my gears, I'm not sure if it grinds you. This word influencer, in the middle of a pandemic, this was the meetup that was organized through social media. Now, some estimate the numbers at 3,000, but let's be fair, let's go for 2,000. But well, that's 2,000 households where parents clearly don't know where their children are. How do you parent against that? So in the right hand side there, you can see a couple of people wearing masks. But look at it, it's like an oxymoron, a masked meter. How do you practice against that as practitioners, as parents, as caregivers? How was that organized? Insta, TikTok, WhatsApp, that's it. And now we're asking why they're not, you know, people are not sure why there should be a second shutdown. So the truth is, if we're gonna look at the inner game, the inner game tells us what, it's not these, Facebook changed the game once they put that up. Once that went up, that's what changed the game for Facebook. Do your own research. Those likes, those retweets, those ads, as we've been saying for a long time, are doing a lot more than just making people feel like they're going viral. They're doing what we call what? Secreting the hormone oxytocin that goes to the part of the brain where compassion lives. So to some young people, those likes, tweets, ads, those numbers going up, it's like a hug. It's almost like a hug, a physical hug, the chemical reaction to it. But what about if what they're exchanging is violence? What about if what they're exchanging is sexual exploitation? What about if what they're exchanging is racism? What about if what they're exchanging is, 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 is extremism? So we all know the story of the narcissist. The narcissist. Most of you probably called your ex-partner a narcissist at some point. But what does the narcissist, what does the story tell us? Every time we see that story, it always talks about a young man who was handsome and he fell in love with his own beauty and drowned. But what he doesn't mention is the name of his friends. The name of his friends was Echo 
and nemesis. And when I understood that, I was like, look at that. Echo, who kept telling him or her what they wanted to hear. So like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Echo chamber, hence that word, and nemesis enemy. So do, what, why, do you think, why do you think all these filters are on here? That can make your eyes look better and your lips a bit more fuller and your jawbone a bit more, not that I use them. These things are by design the same science and practitioners and experts that they use in the gambling industry, they've brought some of them over to the social media industry because that's the thing that will put you that, make you put that last pound in there. That's why Fortnite is so addictive because Fortnite is the new, the new lick, right? Pay as you grow. You want to grow? Someone's got to swipe that card. Think about that. And you're a little seven-year-old child now and you're in class and everyone's got this little, got to this level or have got this certain type of tool and you haven't got it and now you have to lie because you can't get it because mom or dad, whoever's got the card to pay for that next level. Challenges on. So, at its most extreme, we can see what it does. The New Zealand terror attack, 50 plus people murdered while praying. But here's the thing, live streaming it. Live streaming it like it's Call of Duty. And for those of you who saw it, he wasn't panicking. He didn't seem scared, he was all controlled. But he did it online, which is different. Evil. And below, similarly, that evil act by that person who went into that children's concert and had a suicide best on and killed 20 plus people and injured hundreds. How do you think, where do you think a lot of these extremists learned their ideology, their evil ideologies. So when we look at the, the, the online, we, we, yeah, we look at the, the bullying and all these things, that day-to-day -day stuff that's horrendous as well, but this, we can, this is the macro of it. And what we see now is the increase in a lot more ideological hate. And the last few weeks has taught us that someone could just announce, get yourself to Trafalgar Square, we're gonna protect our statues. They themselves don't go, but then hundreds, thousands of people turn up and put themselves in arms way. So the person who said it, who's not even online, just that their video was shared online, because they're banned from online, that's how it can go, just like that. And then as a side point, we're starting to see an increase in a lot more far right link ups and how are they linking up not in spaces not in buildings but online so we're not just talking about the micro day-to-day -day safeguarding of young people we're not talking about the mid the gangs the sushi violence the the, the, the um, county lines and all this but look at the macro and let's not forget Let's not forget this image. Because one thing about exploitation is that it's not binary. For those of you who don't recognize, it's the three young girls that got groomed from East London and ended up joining ISIS. Overtly, they weren't religious if that makes sense. They were high achievers at school. They, by all accounts, they had good relationships with their parents. Even when you read some of the, 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 the read around some of it, that some of them were spending time with their cousin the day before that they left, dancing and having jokes and, yeah, and I'm just going into, I'm just going into school, mum, to collect my work. 24 hours later, counter-terrorism police are at the door saying, we think your children have left for Syria, 15 years old, groomed, exploited from their bedrooms. 
by achieving students. So with us, and I'd say this to everyone, what is vigilant? So vigilant is this, we've all got a concern, but what's our influence? Because at the moment, our concern is, is eclipsing our influence. How do we go here? So like I said, micro, mid, macro. We know on a day-to-day -day level, these are some of the things. Uh, recently, um, someone, uh, a young person, um, committed suicide. And, you know, it was on the back of bullying. It transpired that some of that bullying was coming from some of, the, some of his relatives, not just his school friends. So these are the day-to-day -day things. But these, when we look at radicalization, What's interesting about radicalization, it's a slower process. When I mean it's a slower process, is to do that extreme act. To do that extreme act. Think about that, a suicide vest in a children's concert. I wanna share something with you. Um, let me know if you can hear this. Started searching out like the best voice changers. Can you hear I came across this one. It's cool. it just kind of like pitches yeah, on the The only downside is it's an XL. Can you hear that, man? I can hear it, man. I can hear it. I can hear okay, it. so everyone can hear this. So this is interesting. So online, you've got these um, sound wave things where you can change the voice. Now imagine your child, your niece, or your nephew playing online again, right? And you said, "Who are you playing with?" I'm just playing with that person. I always play with them online. Mum knows, Gran knows. All right, carry on playing. But look at, listen to this. So you're going to need an interface with that. And a lot of times in my videos, I do things like this. Hey, what's up? My voice is different. Hey, what's up? What's up? I want to be able to do that, to do that live. So I started searching up like the best voice changers. I came across this one. It's called the Morph Vox Pro. It's free for seven days, or you can buy the full version. And it's $39.99. So we're about to test out, in my opinion, the world's best voice changing program. I've literally not been able to find anyone better than this. Let's do it. So first let me So that's the same man. This is literally one of the best voice change ones on here. You also have to change it. Now imagine that. How do you know who your child's playing with online, playing a game against? In terms of safe, staying safe online, in terms of the controls in your house, um, you should know, if not by now, how to do that, if I'm honest. But if you don't know, get hold of your provider, go online, put the parenting controls on, make sure, double check, triple check, but also share this. There's an organization, I'm gonna show you a link to them that I'll, if you wanna find out more about this, you can link them. But also, let's think about this. Let's think about safety from this perspective. There's a whole range of reports and evidence about the effects of porn on young people, the effects of violence on young people. Yeah, the way that, the, the, the way that, 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 you know, I often say Instagram is like someone could have a pair of Balenciagos, uh, you know, money dropped on the bed, a fake rollie, and it looks like they're balling, but the truth is they live in the box room at their mom's house on the bunk bed with their little brother. So this smoke and mirrors world, even with politics, Look how it affects, if you can get people's attention, and this is the universal law that we go by. If someone can get your attention, they can change your perception, which can affect your reality, that's it. First thing is though, is to get your attention. And unfortunately, social media's got a generation's attention. Name me the last young person you've met that's not online. So for evil put fair, all the good have to do is nothing. So what I want you to do is very, very quickly for the next 30 seconds, because I know I've gone slightly gone over. I want you to think, what is your organization's online strategy and where is it? Because that's where the pushback comes. What's your online strategy? Where is it? Where's the document? 
if you are an organization, where's your content? Where's your campaigns? Some of you as well have to come from behind the net organization and be visible. A meme um, and a tweet and, you know, we need to visible because this is where the pushback comes, back, comes from. Westwood is visible. So if you want to be, if you want to push back, it's time for some of you to be visible. Where's your energy going? I saw a thing on TikTok the other day where a, ch um, a, a child was saying they, they, they ran this prank on their dad and, or their mum and dad and they said, mum and dad, they shouted it down the stairs, make me an effing sandwich now. And all you can hear is, that's mum and dad running upstairs to go and deal with it. And then the child's there with the phone, prank. So social media is low in the water line. And it's relentless, it's 24 seven. It's 24 seven, right? Meaning as that has always been 24 seven, it's only recently they've opened the doors to us. So the, it has to be 24 seven. What's your campaign every week? In this post, in this COVID era, it's time for you to look at your campaigns. It's time to look at your online portals. The old model, might be semi-defunct for the time being anyway. Strategies. So there's the link for Skips Education Safety. Really cool people over there. Check in with them um, if you want to. And they send out workbooks and so on um, and link them and tell them Ray sent you so you might be able to get a discount. But it's time to push back. Yeah. It's an ideological attack. It's no longer just about attention. It's time to push back. That's Ben's sign that says Ray. Dance done. <laughs> Ray, oh man. I mean, I don't even mind you going over because it's always a pleasure um, just to, to hear you. And yet, I knew you were going to go left field and that's exactly what um, I expected. So thank you so much. We have, we've got about five minutes. Oh, fine. Um, if anyone has any burning questions, um, and if you've got anything, you can just pop it in the Q and A. But I think, obviously, Ray has just, um, as he said, done the dance. But he's done very well in just explaining and just had a bit of a conversation, more than a bit of a conversation. He's gone deep into why this online thing is the state of where it's at. So um, if there is no questions, I'm basically gonna gonna close the session because we've got one more session coming up. Ray, you can see everybody. Um, looking and saying thank you uh, for, for what you're doing. So that's really, Please. You know, that, should, that should be pleasing to your soul. Um, but yeah, we've got another session coming up right now, uh, just around mental health. Um, it's going to be run by Whitney Isles. And yeah, you know, well-being and mental health, that's going to become, hopefully you've got the, the link and, and stuff already. That's going to be coming up in the next 15 minutes. Shout out to Whitney. Yeah, big up Whitney. Um, but yeah, this, this if you missed this, and you got it if you didn't see it in real time, but this will be uploaded um, a little bit later on. But Ray, I also want to say thank you once again. Um, it's always fresh, it's always new, it's always deep, it's always rich. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, man. Uh, any final words? Please, man. Any final words, Ray? Listen, it's time, man. It's an ideological attack. You know, and, you know, youth work, um, sometimes we can, that, that, Craig mentioned it earlier, you know, there's, there's youth work, but there's working with young people, um, and they're two different things. And, um, you know, more than ever as communities, um, especially communities of colour, not primarily, but any community, you know, it, it, this is the era where youth work's needed more than ever, because there's a lot of pain and trauma out there. So keep going, people. The fact that you're here online in the middle of the day, you know, trying to get the knowledge and try and share knowledge. And there's some great practitioners in the, in the room. I can see that already. So stay blessed, yeah? Peace. Nice one. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see you in another 15 minutes. Peace. Take care.